we're going to do is uh, we're going to have three different sets of short presentations, uh, five minutes each. Uh, we have Anna Herford, who's from uh, Columbia University. Uh, we have Amy Margulies from Johns Hopkins. And we've got Kafri Ajay from Harvard. And each of these will be doing a minor project, and they're going to present some of the ideas, uh, laying special emphasis on methods, tools, stuff that they learned, given the words are used in five minutes each, and I, we will be keeping track of time. When that ends, uh, we will have we will open it, open it up to the audience and uh, people can ask questions. And um, so let's let's keep more time for the questions. So uh, let's carry on, uh, Anna. Very quickly tell you about the Ianda project, Indicators of Affordability of Nutritious Diets in Africa. And even though our first two countries were Ghana and Tanzania, uh, as part of this grant from Imana, um, the indicators are really designed so that they could be used in any country or any context. Uh, this was kind of the proof of concept in these two countries, and we really learned a lot about the different food price data collection systems and actors and what we could uh, work with in, in the two different contexts. Um, so the team you can see here, I'm presenting on behalf of our whole uh, Ianda team with Jennifer Coates, Will Masters, Jan Bai, and Zachary Gersten from Tufts, Daniel Sarpong, an economist from University of Ghana, uh, Fulgens Mishili, an economist at Sokwina University in Tanzania, and Joyce Kinabo at Sokwina University, and uh, Rebecca Heidkamp at Johns Hopkins. So the vision of this project is that when we speak of food prices, the concept that we would like to see should reflect the food people need for healthy and active lives. So when we talk about, you know, we hear the term food prices, it should reflect safe, nutritious food to meet dietary needs, which is the basis of uh, food security, access to adequate food. However, that is not actually what it is reflected in food prices as they're measured. They, when you hear the term food prices, it generally means either starchy staples, such as what is uh, monitored in the World Food Program Market Monitor, um, very detailed uh, monitoring of staple prices, or a basket of foods that's most economically important or most often consumed. Um, and one example of that is the FAO Food Price Index of Global Food Prices, which includes only the uh, commodities of sugar, cereals, dairy, vegetable oils, and meat. Uh, these are clearly economically important commodities that, that were just simply, this index was not designed at all to reflect nutritious diets. Um, so we set out to create an alternative uh, way to look at food prices that would reflect nutritious diets. And in the two countries where we were working, we did a data landscaping of all the different actors who collect food prices. And uh, after interviewing the different stakeholders and working with them in our first workshop, our key data sources ended up being two in each country. Um, in both countries, there's a statistical agency that collects consumer prices, and in both countries, there was an agency collecting market prices of agricultural commodities in a market information system. Um, so that was the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Ghana and the Ministry of Industry and Trade in Tanzania. And we selected these as key data sources because they're national. We wanted to work with national stakeholders. Um, they have data from all over the country so that we can compare prices in different regions. And they also have a mandate to provide public data as well as having adequate diversity in their food lists. For example, one of our potential data sources of food prices was the East Africa Grain Council. They have lovely data and uh, collect it really well, but they only collect the staple grain prices, so we couldn't use that to construct indicators of nutritious diets. Um, so we worked, this is uh, pictures of going to the market with enumerators in Ghana. We worked with the existing food price system, that's a key piece of this project, was not to collect our own new data, but to work with the data systems already in place. So we accompanied the Ministry of Food and Agriculture staff to the markets, um, and we actually worked with them to expand their food list, that they already had a system in place that was very robust, um, covering 164 markets nationwide every week. Um, but it didn't include a lot of really nutritious foods that are commonly consumed in Ghana. So, for example, it didn't include, include any green leafy vegetables. And the one being weighed on the top, Nkontumre, is a very popular uh, cocoa yam leaf 
that's really important for nutrition and dietary diversity in Ghana, and that's one of the foods that we added to their food list. Um, they've been a really wonderful collaborate, collaborating institution. They um, piloted the expanded food list in four districts in the country, and it went very well. So they actually decided to institutionalize the expanded food list nationwide. So Ghana is now collecting uh, food prices for um, diverse foods for nutritious diets that can be used to construct indicators of the cost of d diverse diets. And we developed four such indicators. One is a nutritious food price index, which works only with the statistical organizations. Um, it uses the, it's an alternative to the consumer price index for food, but instead of weighting the foods based on their economic importance, it weights them based on their nutritional importance. So you can look at the two side by side. And the cost of diverse diet is another index that measures uh, the price is changing of minimal dietary diversity, which is five out of 10 group, food groups in the minimum dietary diversity for women score. Um, then two indicators uh, show the absolute cost of buying a, di uh, a nutritious diet. And one is uh, the cost of foods to meet nutrient adequacy using a linear program. And the other is cost of a recommended diet, which is a simple calculation of uh, the cost to meet the recommended number of servings in each food group every day. So we have developed these four indicators. It depended on good data to begin with. Um, that's one of the lessons learned is to have you know, really good data to start with. But using the existing monitoring systems, we were able to show that we actually could use these existing systems to, with very little added cost to provide better information for nutrition impact regarding food access and food prices. Just to introduce myself, my name is Amy Margolis. Um, I work for IFPRI, but also uh, doing a PhD at Johns Hopkins. And I'm here standing in for Dr. Aulo Geli, who's leading this work in Malawi. So first, an apology that I don't have the charming Italian accent. Um, <laughs> And secondly, um, to those of you who attended the Value Chains for Nutrition session, some of the diagnostics will already be familiar to you, but we'll see here how they were applied um, in the field. So just as an overview, um, we're interested in looking at Value Chains for Nutrition um, because we want to think about how markets can work for the poor. So how can they deliver um, improved nutritious foods to low-income populations? Um, it can provide us with a framework, a lens to examine the role of markets in food systems and looking at all of these steps along the chain. So from production all the way to consumption. But we also know that a value chain is specific to a commodity. It's something we discussed uh, quite a bit in our workshop that one, having a very efficient chain in one commodity won't resolve the question of enhancing diets overall. So the focus on value chains has very much been on efficiency and economic returns. And so the question is, how can, this, uh, how can markets do the work for nutrition? So part of the work that we did um, that Aula led was looking at different diagnostics to evaluate different contexts, um, beginning with taking several steps to think through how can interventions best be designed to address these problems. So first, um, looking at understanding the nutrition problem. So of course, every context, there may be a different issue. It may be un undernutrition, it may be a micronutrient deficiency. So mapping out the nutrition problem, then looking through the overall macro level food systems context. So what is the enabling environment um, for markets? And characterizing diet patterns, contribution of different foods. There might be foods missing in the diet that are important, or there may be foods that are contaminated, for example, uh, with aflatoxin in ground nuts. Um, and then identifying value chain constraints and opportunities related to nutrition. And finally, prioritizing your intervention options. So Allo developed a supply and demand typology, essentially to map uh, different chains, looking at supply and demand. So demand being the consumption levels in the target population that you're interested in improving their nutrition, and then supply being year-round availability. So of course, here, seasonality is a concern. Um, so we have four different quadrants with different combinations of demand and supply. 
in the case study. So we took these diagnostics and we actually were leveraging some existing um, data collection activities that IFPRI was conducting as part of an evaluation, an ongoing RCT of a nutrition sensitive agriculture program in Zomba, in the district of Zomba in Malawi. So we had a mixed methods descriptive study. It was two rounds of data collection. So for quantitative data, we had a panel of 1,200 households, including a seven-day recall food consumption module. And qualitative data, also two rounds um, looking at household case studies um, with in-depth interviews. We also had Jason Donovan, who did a quite an in-depth market study looking at different types of foods available in markets and speaking to traders and farmers as well. So here's a quite a dense mapping of the quadrants. Um, these are looking at five key commodities that were found in the markets in Zomba. So actually you can see that there are nutritious foods available in these markets, but that each chain or each type of food has its own constraint, one might say, and accompanying intervention. So here, for example, you might see that groundnuts are an example they are consumed throughout the year. There's a lot of um, demand, there's adequate supply, but there's an issue with aflatoxin. So then you would think through what's the intervention option to address those issues specific to that chain. So the implications here, we actually tested um, these diagnostics with two different interventions, one being the nutrition sensitive agricultural program, which is more long-term outcomes, and then also a food transfer that was provided by the Malawi Vulnerability um, Assistance Committee. So the results indicate there was a need for a layered approach to diets. So during the lean season, we actually found that the food transfers were um, very helpful in terms of improving the diets of children and consumption. And so they were good on the short term. But then for the harvest season, we needed more nutrition education, production support, and then looking forward to optimizing decision making on food and nutrition. And then there are potential for longer term interventions um, for improving capacity for product differentiation, processing and storage. And these all can be addressed simultaneously. So really the key takeaways here uh, broadly are the tools support a strategic view, something we also discussed in the workshop. How can we think through different suites of interventions to address um, enhancing diets of low income consumers and how markets can help with that? And the descriptive work is very helpful for doing so. And so these preferences and food systems, they may be highly localized. So it may be important to repeat this type of descriptive work in, in those specific contexts. Um, my name is Kafui Ajeg Bonya, and I'm an Amana Fellow, postdoctoral fellow, um, and I'm working on a project looking at agricultural policies and child undernutrition in low and middle income countries. And my home mentor is um, Dr. Subramanian from the Harvard School of Public Health, and my host mentor is Dr. Kojo from the University of Ghana. So um, for my project, I rather than focusing on individual and household level factors related to agriculture and nutrition, I wanted to focus more on um, systems level contextual factors. So um, at a macroeconomic level, looking at macroeconomic policies, um, such as trade liberalization in agriculture and how those might be related to um, nutritional outcomes through um, food security. So um, for my um, project, the questions I'm examining are whether government policies um, that distort agricultural prices are associated with undernutrition levels um, in children in low and middle income countries, and also whether the association differs for children coming from agricultural versus non-agricultural households. So um, the conceptual framework I'm working with is um, looking at the links between agricultural price policies and undernutrition um, through their impacts on food crop prices. And these could have direct impacts um, on nutrition through consumption, or they could also um, impact nutrition through income pathways. So for um, people who are producers of um, agricultural products, and these, um, these effects might uh, work in opposite directions based on whether someone is mostly producing versus consuming these products. So 
Um, the data I'm using, I'm doing a cross-country analysis using um, cross-sectional, repeated cross-sectional data from about 26 countries, mostly in Africa, but also including some Latin American, Asian, and Central European countries. And so I'm using data from the World Bank's updated distortions to agricultural incentives database. And, and these um, data include measures that quantify um, government interventions in agricultural prices. And then I'm linking this data to data from um, demographic and health surveys. So there, are about, there were about 85 um, DHS surveys that had data that um, also from the um, distortions to agricultural incentives. So I was able to link those data sets um, and look at um, surveys between 1986 and 2011. Um, and I'm focusing my sample on children between the ages of six months and 35 months. So the main um, policy measure that I'm focusing on is called the nominal rate of assistance to agriculture. And um, it's defined as the percentage by which government policies have raised gross returns to farmers above what they would be without government intervention. So essentially it looks at the magnitude of the change in prices that government interventions put on agricultural policies and it takes it on agricultural prices and it um, quantifies it as a percentage of the original price of um, agriculture. So positive values represent government assistance to agriculture. So this could be through subsidies or through taxes on imports that compete with uh, locally produced products. And negative values represent taxation through like export taxes. And the value of zero means that there's no intervention or no distortion in the prices. So this graph just shows, shows some trends in some of these NRA values over time for a few countries. And so in addition to these measures, I'm also including measures from the world development indicators, such as GDP, population measures, also looking at measures of democracy and globalization, um, and also trying to um, control for these and see how they're associated with undernutrition, changes in undernutrition. So for my outcomes, I'm looking at height for age, weight for height, and weight for age Z scores, so measures of stunting, wasting, and underweight. And then I'm trying to look at whether the effects might differ for children coming from agricultural versus non-agricultural households. And in addition, I'm including a, um, covariates from the children, their um, maternal, their mother's um, information, as well as household information. So for my analysis, I'm using a regression analysis. Um, and so I'm looking at the, using the changes over time and across countries um, in these agricultural price policies um, to do a fixed effects analysis. So essentially what that does is it looks at changes in the um, policy measures over time in relation to changes in the under nutrition measures over time. So the, um, using these country level fixed effects helps to control for confounders. So whether there are anything in a country that's stable over time will be controlled for in the model. And then I'm also including um, year fixed effects to control for global trends. And then including a number of covariates, which I mentioned um, to um, control for things that vary over time at both the country level and at the individual and household level. And so this is just sort of an example of what the model um, looks like. So I, I think while that is stuck, I, that's basically what I was going to say. I, I have a poster um, tomorrow, so I can talk more about what some of my preliminary results are showing. Um, and so I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I think I'm out of time, so I will end there. Thank you. I have a lot of questions for all of you, but I'll, I'll try to <laughs> rein back of it um, and start with just Anna and say, it, it, first of all, it's fantastic to hear that what the project has accomplished, especially in terms of the Ghana Ministry of, uh, of Agriculture, Food and Agriculture uptake, which is great. I, I just had one question about, and I don't really know if there's an answer to this or if you've already rejected this idea, but I've often heard that it's not just the cost of the good food which matters, it's also the relative cost of the good versus the junk food. And I wondered if you had considered um, looking at the cost of other types of food, uh, including, so I don't know what really, but street food, junk food, um, other sugar, <laughs> other kinds of things which might affect uh, the relative cost of the expensive diet as well, which it might affect people's food choices. My question is also to Anna. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, as you said, you have, you're trying to uh, make an index for recommended diets. And uh, so what are those recommendations? Are 
and the uh, diets can have several foodstuffs which can be used alternatively I mean so how do you exactly so there are fruits but fruit of so uh, several fruit may have different uh, prices so how do you actually measure it my question is goes to for the second pre second presenter uh, value chain uh, I think, uh, as we all know, the value chain has its own drawbacks for to improve nutrition. Uh, the first one is uh, it is it's mostly it is commodity specific, and it most and the other one is uh, majorly uh, the value chains. The consumers are not the major actors throughout the value chains, and in your study uh, from. From the commodity specific point of view, and while we, while we are talking about nutrition, we are talking about diversification. So, how you have been get uh, uh, from the relation between diversification and commodity specific nature of value chain. And also, uh, uh, mostly in the value chain, most actors are playing to add value from economic point of view rather than from nutrition point of view. So how do you see that relationship? Thank you for the questions. Um, so Julia, great question on unhealthy food prices. Um, the, so they do potentially enter into one of our indicators, which we actually have to further develop. It's, we're not quite done with the results yet. Um, so I mentioned that in both countries, there's two different kinds of data. And one of the kinds of data from, for example, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, we could not do that kind of price index because um, they only collect agricultural commodities, no prepared foods or packaged foods. Um, so everything that they collect is basically healthy. <laughs> um, so we can really only do like the price of, the, of healthy diets without accounting for any unhealthy pieces. Now, the one where we can and are working on a, an index is the, um, the consumer price index data from the statistics organizations, which collect like 80 to 100 kinds of foods that people buy. And so those include both the agricultural commodities as well as packaged foods. And um, so far we've, the nutritious food price index, it weights foods based on their nutritiousness. So um, while you know, Coca-Cola may have a high share of expenditures, it would have a very low share of the nutritious food price index. So in that way, it's somewhat accounted for, but then um, the relative prices, we're actually working on an index that would put negative weights on the uh, unhealthy foods. So more to come. Um, and Rohit, your question on the nutritious, the recommended diets. So it's a big question of what is, what is the recommendation? And there are various recommendations that could be used. Um, so far, we used food-based dietary guidelines for comparable countries because e neither one of the countries has national food-based dietary guidelines. Um, but Benin does, which is a close country to Ghana with similar dietary patterns and um, foods. So we've used the, um, the Benin food-based dietary guidelines and simply cost out uh, what what the um, prices, they have four food groups, you know, starchy staples, proteins, vegetables, and fruits, and a number of servings for each of those. So we put all the foods in our list into one of those four categories and take the price of um, the lowest ones uh, for fruits and vegetables because diversity is part of the recommendation. It's not simply the one lowest, but the like three lowest. So you get adequate diversity, but also at low cost to find the lowest cost of actually meeting those recommendations. I think, uh, so this work is still in process, but we have uh, quite a lot of qualitative data that was very interesting, um, looking at uh, household preferences, as well as um, all sorts of barriers that the participants themselves were expressing. So for example, there were a number of gender barriers um, to women's participation in local markets. Um, there were other things such as aggressive behavior by vendors who control prices. And so it, in that process, we're sort of identifying different um, entry points and constraints um, for these local value chains, because we see that there are nutritious foods available. So you could be sourcing a basket of nutritious foods from these local markets. Um, but that qualitative data, I think, will be feeding in quite a bit to what we've already seen in the quantitative data. 
about the changes that are occurring. And then on the second question about um, adding value from a not just the economic point of view, I think um, one important thing that we have going is there's a, a lot of buy-in and collaboration from various actors. So really um, engaging with government, so with the government of Malawi on the Malawi Vulnerability Assessment Committee, as well as um, NGOs and um, the World Food Program. We've been deeply involved in talking with them about their operational approach and how to pair these um, different types of interventions together. So joining the efforts of government and NGOs NGOs and community-based programs to work toward that common objective. I think that's the challenge in kind of stimulating both the supply and demand side. I, I have one for each of you, actually, and thank you very much, all of you. Um, the first one, I guess, is for Amy, and um, I, uh, I, I wanted to find out how you measured demand. You know when you said that um, you know, supply is, is, is high or the demand is low or demand is high, I wondered how you figured out that demand was high or low. Um, that was the first question there. And then for Kafui, I was, I'm coming to see your poster for sure. Um, but um, my question was about, uh, when you first started talking, you talked about a lot of different policies that might affect it, but then your, your presentation was mostly about the NRA, about nominal rate of assistance. And I wondered, I mean, obviously a, a very important factor which is, is well known to affect uh, this is, is food subsidies for grains and, and, and consumer subsidies and so on, and minimum pricing and so And I wondered if you had also, uh, probably you have covered that and you just didn't have time to talk about it, right? <laughs> okay. You were uh, explaining... Uh, how um, the nominal rate of uh, protection and how it affects um, um, households. I wanted to know whether you would like to separate, or maybe before I, before I go ahead, you know, a, a, a certain policy will affect uh, households differently depending on whether they are net buyers or net sellers. So a higher or lower price will affect households uh, differently. So it's, it's difficult to get a win-win situation for everybody. So I was thinking um, whether you are going to separate out the, the effects or impacts on um, the different types of um, households. I also had a question for Kafwe, which is um, um, interesting work on agriculture policies. Um, and um, what I'm curious about is how your work ties in with some of the past literature in this area, like for example, uh, the block and web work, uh, the paper on, uh, you know, which used, uh, nom you know, uh, similar measures, uh, but I guess uh, approaching the problem in a slightly different way and perhaps uh, bringing in obesity and so on as well. Um, and then all, there have also been a, a few streams of work recently, um, although a lot of this area tends to be small case studies and suggestive ideas rather than any st statistical establishment. And that's a big weakness, I think, in this literature. And so there is scope, I can see, for uh, improving the evidence base. So um, how it compares to some of these uh, papers that have appeared perhaps in the last five to 10 years, which have tackled similar themes. I also have a question for Amy. Um, so, uh, you know, all the, uh, very exciting stuff about the value chains and, and, and um, using this tool to do diagnostics and, and, and potentially solve things at a local scale. But I think what one of the question, one of the takeaways from many value chain studies is that it all has to be locally based. So every locality has its own set of problems. And so you have to use the diagnostics in a local area and then figure it out and, and then find out interventions that will supply it. I'm always thinking at the back of my mind, and I always say this in, in reviews of um, um, CRPs and so on, which, uh, which you get to comment on, is uh, who is collecting the cost effectiveness information on this? Is this, can we show that this is cost effective, that doing this say locality by locality, you know, identifying interventions. You can see it's valuable that it solves a certain local nutrition problem, but is it something that can cost effectively be, you know, applied across space, you know? Um, it, one of the problems with many interventions is that uh, successful interventions typically can be duplicated and replicated quite quickly. Um, can that happen with value chains when you have, when everything is so, 
site specific. Um, it might be a more difficult question than what uh, your project is trying to answer, but just your reflections on that would be useful. It's capturing um, subsidies, capturing um, taxation, capturing subsidies on both inputs as well as outputs. And so it um, takes that information, and so the, the way that they just said it's set up, they have um, NRA um, values for specific products, and then they also have them for certain sectors of agriculture, so tradable agriculture, so those are export crops and import competing crops, as well as non-tradable um, agriculture. And then there's measures that look at the whole agricultural sector, so sort of taking weighted averages across the agricultural sector. So um, I think that was one of the benefits of the NRA measure compared to other measures is that it does try to capture different types of government intervention, so not just like one type, whether it's like tariffs or taxes, but also tries to, tries to look at all the ways in which governments are distorting prices. For some types of measures, the effect on consumers is the same magnitude, but op in opposite direction as on um, producers. But they also, the data set does also have a consumer tax equivalent, which measures the, the ways that government interventions affect um, prices for consumers. So that is also something that can be included in the models. Um, I don't know if I should answer all the questions for me or Okay, so the, the, I think the next question was about looking at different effects for different households. So yes, that's um, what one of my main things to look at is. So I'm including an interaction. So I've in with the DHS, there's information on whether the child's mother, the child's mother's and father's occupation. So I can use that to see whether the child has a parent that's employed in agriculture and then look at whether the effects might differ for children whose parents are employed in the agricultural sector versus those who aren't. So that's um, what I'm, in, I'm including um, that type of interaction between the policy and the household um, uh, measures in my in my um, models, and then I think the last question was about um, how this work compares to some of the previous literature. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of the literature that I looked at earlier was f um, focusing a lot on like especially on trade liberalization and those types of um, policies in agriculture and how that um, affects health. And uh, I think a lot of the, there were quite a few studies I came across looking at, for example, structural adjustment programs and what were the impacts on um, nutrition or on other types of health outcomes. Um, and um, a lot of them were looking at changes over time. And as you mentioned, a lot of them were doing more case studies um, and not really able to control for a lot of other confounding factors. So I think what I was hoping to do here was um, try to use statistical methods to try to control for some of these other confounding factors that have really been difficult to tease out in some of the previous literature. Um, so doing this types of cross country with fixed effects. So hopefully that's something that can add to the literature on this um, piece. But I'll, I definitely will like to see more work in that this area as well. To your question, Julia. Right? Okay. Um, I think you were asking about how we were mapping the quadrants and using the different commodities and fitting them into the quadrants, where that came from understanding the demand. Um, so th that mapping actually was an output of two sources of data, one being the quantitative household survey. So that was looking at what are households actually consuming, what types of foods are they spending money on in the market. So we have um, descriptive data looking at um, what, what people are eating over over the seasons as well, you know, in the lean season, what they're not eating, what they are, and then matching that with the data that Jason Donovan collected in the separate market study. So he was really, um, you know, I should have included a slide, but very detailed information on uh, what was available in every single market seasonally, um, when things were not available, and so on. So I, I believe that was used, both types of data were used to map the quadrants. And the second question um, was a very tricky one. <laughs> no, it's, it's a great question for, for thought, I think. Um, thinking through is, are, is this approach using the diagnostics and seeing that it may be very locally based, is this a cost-effective approach? Um, 
I think it remains to be seen. I think um, we're, it's, it's a developing um, area and I think there needs to be, we need to build the evidence base. So I think there may well be commonalities across contexts. Um, we still need more information. And I think also looking toward, especially kind of these new collaborations across actors, um, working through kind of suites of interventions, perhaps there are certain packages or suites of interventions or types of pairings that may work across contexts. Um, so, you know, we could be drawing broader lessons from this once we have more evidence. That's what I would hope. Uh, so the, I guess it's a three-part answer. First of, of all, it's scaling up the use within the countries where we worked. So now we have the right connections with collaborators in the government agencies that collect data. Um, and what we, we are planning to do, if we have workshops in those countries in August, um, to be able to work with those agencies to build the capacity to actually track these indicators. So they're collecting the data, and we have the methodology for the indicators, but we need to work out who exactly will be um, tracking them and reporting them. So we have uh, ways to do that, but that work is yet to be completed. Um, working in these two countries with the different agencies has been hugely informative for um, just the diversity between the two of them, let alone what may be encountered in other countries, especially for the um, agricultural market prices. Less so for the consumer price index because that's a fairly standard approach across countries, but the agricultural marketing market information can vary a lot about who collects that data and what their methods are. So we would definitely like to scale up in other countries and um, now, I think we, we've learned who to approach, what kinds of data are most useful, and it would be much simpler and faster for us to work in other countries to, um, to do the same approach in other countries. And so we're already starting to plan ways that we could do that and looking for funding to be able to do that. And then at the global level as well, um, this is a this kind of indicator is something we would love to see tracked across countries and um, FAO is one of the global actors that would be an appropriate place to work on that, uh, especially in things like their flagship publication on um, food, state of food and nutrition in the world, for example. Um, so we've been exploring ways to do that and so there's one group at FAO that's supposed to be tracking food CPIs. They're having a hard time of it because <laughs> the data is not always easy to find, uh, even though it's supposed to be reported by all countries every year, but not necessarily to FAO. So they're searching for it. Um, if they manage to, find, to, to get a kind of well-oiled system of getting that information, then we could work with them to also calculate and report a nutritious food CPI. Then there's also the uh, GUs, the Global Information Early Warning System people, who collect um, food prices every month from countries. They are super interested in partnering with us. Right now they only work on staple prices, um, but that's simply because of a lack of capacity. There's only two people who work on that initiative in FAO. And if they had more, uh, more people or more uh, resources to be able to actually <laughs> literally contact the countries for more data, um, then we could work with them to actually get more diverse foods and be able to construct the indicators across different countries. You know, the interventions that are easy to do, like you go into a farm, um, you change its production diversity, and then you look at the impacts, because that's a very, you know, neat intervention in a sense, because you can control everything to within that household or that farm. But the really interesting stuff, and really, absolutely critical stuff is happening at a higher level at markets because even in the most remote uh, parts of the world, markets supply a huge percentage of the food. Um, so even in Afghanistan where we were working, uh, which you think where, you know, the, the infrastructure is terrible, there's conflict, you know, it's all, all gets cut, cut off in winter. The, the uh, Afghanis in, in pretty remote villages were getting 60-70% of their you know, dietary diversity was coming from market purchase as against what they produced on farm. So clearly there is uh, you know, something to, to, there's a lot of work to be done around the markets and prices agenda and, uh, and it seems like Imana has really succeeded in kick-starting um, this work um, and uh, bringing about genuine interventions. We've heard about value chains and, and, and how it's getting more sophisticated when it again we see the work when it started often had an individual commodity focus, so it was a sing single thing like a bean or a... Now it's getting, you know, cross-cutting, looking at markets more generally, and, um, and now it's producing diagnostic tools like 
uh, like the ones we've just heard about from Amy. Um, and it's, it's a tremendously, as we saw from uh, the workshops again earlier today, and, and it's, it's very, very popular. Um, and people are eager to learn about value chains and uh, for nutrition around the world. And it's really get, it is getting more sophisticated, and, and that's really uh, very welcome. Um, and in terms of uh, food prices, uh, collecting the prices of uh, healthy, uh, healthy food items, uh, the, the work that Anna and her team are doing is, is really exciting. It's, it's much needed. Uh, and sometimes, actually, when you sit down and think about it, it's, it's rather surprising that it hasn't been done before. It's one of those things you think, yeah, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer. But, um, you know, but it really sometimes, these kinds of surprising gaps can remain. And, and it's great that it's being plugged now. And I'm very excited to learn about how it will be scaled up and, and scaled out. Um, and, um, and we need to find a way to keep, the, you know, keep it going and not let it sort of become one project. And I think that's the challenge for our community um, because it's, it's too valuable to just let it, um, uh, let it just sort of rest with one project. There are other innovations also, I think, in the food prices area which, which, are, which could potentially exciting. Lots of countries collect, for example, expenditure data from which, in which inherent are food price signals. Now, there are ways in which you can extract food price signals from those expenditure data, which I think remains in an underexplored area. So this, there's a variety of things we can do to really improve the evidence base. And, and, and so I think, um, I'm sure there'll be lots of future work in this area. And Kafui's work on policy, again, something that's, 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 that's really needed. Um, and somebody establishing those, uh, because again, it's, it remains a literature which is littered with case studies, uh, suggestions rather than evidence. Um, and uh, and even the work that's been done more recently has been much more in a uh, non-communicable disease framework. Um, you know, there are studies which show, for example, that if you have a free trade agreement with the U.S., uh, then your country has a 65% chance of uh, of um, you know having higher diabetes rate or something like that. Um, so there are people doing all these off-the-wall things. Um, uh, but you know, there's there's the the, the undernutrition bit of it and, uh, you know, looking at uh, how policies have influenced undernutrition, that's absolutely critical. Um, again, I think uh, our discussions today have, and we've started thinking about whether there are other policy measures we can think about uh, apart from nominal rates of assistance. Or sh are, are there innovations to be made, you know, in, in, in a similar in way in which we're thinking about food prices and collecting healthy food price uh, information? Should we be thinking about rolling out internationally uh, new uh, metrics uh, that can be constructed uh, globally across countries which 10 years hence uh, if mainstreamed would be able to tell us more about agriculture policy in, in a slightly different way or nuanced way or whatever so maybe it's time to think about that now so all in all very exciting uh, congratulations to all, all of you guys and your teams uh, thank you for all the questions from the audience and I think that was a great session thank you, thank you.